When you're weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. I'm on your side when times are tough and friendships can be found like a bridge over troubled water. I will lay me down. I don't know about you. <laughs> But I experience the world, my emotions, relationships, a lot through music. And when I get to certain passages, certain scriptures, my mind turns into a jukebox and song after song after song come to my mind. That's one of them that comes to my mind when I read today's scripture. Like a bridge over troubled water. I will lay me down. That might not be the story or the song that you think of when you think of this particular story, but maybe just maybe if you hear it again, not the song, but the story, you can start thinking of your own songs about the prodigalness of God. This is the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 15th chapter. Now, all the tax collectors and all the sinners, they were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of the sons said to his father, Father, give to me the share of the property that will one day belong to me. So the father divided his property between the sons. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had been given and traveled to a distant country. There he wasted, he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that countryside and the son began to be in need. And so he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly have filled himself with the pea pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything to fill himself with. But one day he came to himself and he said, how many of my father's slaves, hired hands, have bread enough and more to spare, but here I am? Dying of starvation? I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to say to him, Father, I sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while the son was still far off, his father saw him was filled with compassion and he ran and he put his arms around him and, and kissed him and the son said to the father father I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son but the father acknowledging not enough anything the son said spoke to his slaves, saying, quickly, bring out a robe, the, the very best one, put it on my son, put, it, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, go get the fatted calf, the best one, and kill it. Let us eat 
let us celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and now is alive again. He was lost and now is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He called out to one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got his son back safe and sound. The brother became angry. He refused to go in. So his father came out to him and began to beg with him. But the son answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you've never even given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has wasted and devoured your property with prostitutes, comes back, you kill the fatted calf for him? And the father says, son, you are with me always, and all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours, he was dead. And he's come to life again. He was lost and has been found. This is the gospel of our Lord. Jesus tells this parable, this silly story, in response to grumbling from well, people who should know better, people who have received and experienced God's love, people who have seen and known the gifts from the Father. And yet, when the tax collectors who they hate because they were of the Jewish people, and, but worked for the wrong people. They worked for the Romans, so they were traitors. And the sinners, they, they were the people who wouldn't come and sit in the pews properly and, and, and make the sacrifices righteously. The unclean. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe they just were the wrong kind of religion. The, the, the place they worshipped didn't have the right name on the sign. The pagans. All of them. They saw something, they heard something, they experienced something in Christ that brought them out. And Jesus welcomed them and ate with them, which made him unclean, according to Jewish tradition. I guess I fell into this tradition myself. You know, we can't say the A word in Lent. <laughs> there was a little voice in the back of my brain. His name is Thomas Schottower. He's a professor at Wartburg Seminary. Well, he's not anymore, but he was. He was my liturgy professor. And the minute he started playing, I won't even finish the word. I got tense because we have to follow the rules, right? That's what we do. We human beings, we wear these masks of righteousness, masks of proper behavior. And, and quite often, they're good. They, they help us. They help us manage relationships. They help us manage the world, and they can be a good thing. But we also use them to try and help us manage kind of these, this reconciliation thing between us and God. And that's where it falls apart. Because we end up being like this son. I think we got a problem here. The prodigal son 
as he is called, is one of the misnamed parables of Christ. Because the word for prodigal, I'll never forget this. When I was a teenager, I was in confirmation. And I actually looked up the word prodigal. And the word, for pro, the word prodigal means extravagantly wasteful. And I thought to myself, teenage Matthew, extravagant means something good, doesn't it? And, 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 and I, I saw this parable and I, I said to my pastor, I said, the, the son in this isn't extravagantly wasteful. He's just wasteful. Dissolute living is, 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 is what leads him to death. The only one in this parable who is prodigal is the father. Again and again, the father is, is, is pouring out his love and his, his, his invitation to the sons. And, and Jesus gives us this clue from the beginning because he tells them this parable. And the first words out of his mouth are, there was a man. That's the title of the parable. Who had two sons. That's what the relationship is about. And so the word prodigal actually never appears in the story. The word Prodigal comes later in tradition, and yet it is a good word for this story. If you understand, it is about the father and his extravagantly wasteful or grace-filled pouring out of that melting moment of love that he again and again gives to his son. Because that's what this is about. This is about Christ saying to everyone around him that they have missed the melting heart of God. I don't know if you quite get what I'm talking about. I, I, I was in the hotel a couple weeks ago with Elias and Yvette, and Elias had gotten hermit crabs. Yvette is not a pet person. We don't have pets in our house, but grandma, my mom, she would have a zoo. And so Elias got to get some grandma pets. They stay at grandma's. <laughs> but Elias wanted the pets to stay with us at the hotel while we were there. And the minute we woke up the next morning after we had them at the hotel for the night. Yvette comes to me and she looks at me and kind of does that parent mouthing to each other thing that we do and goes, they are not coming home with us. Which I knew they weren't, but... And she thought, I think, Elias was asleep still. And I was like, okay, yeah, they're not coming home with us. Why? And she goes, all night, all I heard was... And in one of those melt-your-heart moments that you get only from kids, Elias just kind of leans over, opens up one of his eyes, and goes, Well, no duh, Ma, they're nocturnal. <laughs> Elias is six, by the way. I, I don't know that I knew the word nocturnal when I was six. Children, I think, give us an understanding of the heart of God. Another time that I was riding bikes with Elias, I was teaching him how to ride his bike. I said to him, I said, do me a favor, we ride in front of me, please? And he kind of looked at me, he goes, why? I said, I said, just trust me, ride in front of me. This is my boy who has to understand everything. And he goes, oh, it's because you'd rather get hit and run over than see me get run over, huh? He gets it. You see, the son, he wasn't prodigal. He was just lost. He was wandering. And that's what we do. We get lost. 
We, we wander. The Father expects that. We want the things and the blessings of relationship, the things that belong to us, we think, so that we can run out into the world and enjoy our life. And then when we run low and the world lifes us, we come back home. Sometimes wanting more, thinking we deserve it, but, but sometimes also like the son was. Father, I've wronged you. I've, you know, recognizing that we've done wrong. But the point of the story is again how the father responds. You see, in Jewish tradition, the people who heard this story, when they heard that the father saw the son far off, that father should have been standing at the doorway, arms crossed, tapping his foot, going, eh, not so smart now, are you? And he should have waited, standing in righteousness, saying, come on, boy, come on home. Tail between your legs, you can come in, sit at the table, be a good boy, and maybe I'll let you in. But instead, this uncouth, embarrassing father runs to him, falls all over him, throws his arms around him, kisses him, won't even listen to his confession. How very prodigal of him. He pours out grace upon grace to melt away the masks of the world. To say, you are my son. You are my child. And no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, I will love you. I will make you mine every time. And I will bring you in, and I will heal you, and I will hug you, and I will hold you. Jesus says to the people grumbling about the tax collectors and sinners, they belong to God. They are your brothers and your sisters. And God will bring them in too. Even though they haven't earned it, even though they're unworthy of love and belonging in your sight, they're not in God's. And today, this is what God is inviting you to as well. To that melting moment where God reaches out and it's not even just a touch on your cheek. It's not even just a, a light welcoming in. It's a wrapping God's arms around you, pulling you in, not ever wanting to let you go again. Saying, I know what you've done, and I don't care. I know what you've been through, and, and I know it has hurt, and it matters. But what doesn't matter is what you think of yourself. What doesn't matter is that you think you're unworthy because I will make you worthy. Because you're mine. And I love you. And I will make this your home again. And it doesn't matter what your brother thinks or what anybody else thinks. And then again with the brother. This is the, ama the amazing thing. So some of you might be older siblings who look at this and go, well, 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 the older brother has a right to feel what he does. I know my older siblings struggle with this. I'm the youngest of my biological siblings. My middle sister especially struggles with this sometimes. The father, when the son says, this son of yours... He distances himself from his brother. And what does the father do? He gives the son his brother back. He doesn't say, oh yeah, this son of mine was lost and is found, was dead as alive. He says, no, 
No, no, no, no, no, no. This brother of yours was dead, was, was, was destroyed, was, was torn apart. And now has been knit back together. He was lost. But the word for lost isn't just he lost his way. The word for lost here is he was undone. He was unmade. He was become nothing. And now has been discovered again. In all the ways that you have felt unmade or lost or broken or dead. Right here, right now. God is throwing arms around you to discover you again. To hold you again. To make you whole and God's again. This is the good news in the gospel. Not that you have to confess or come home because God has never left your side. While you are far off, God is running to you. While you are far off, God is calling you to this altar. While you are far off, God runs to you and clothes you in grace and glory, clothes you literally in Christ so that you can live again. My prayer for you today is that in this calling, you can take on Christ. You can feel and hear and celebrate this truth and live truly your identity the trueness of your worth and your value of belonging in and through Christ. That you may experience this gospel and then go out and be this good news to other people. Become the reconciliation of God that you have felt here today. Be that melting moment that you have in and through him.